Okay, it's time. Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to our talk. Uh, I'm Anton. There is Daniel. We're both engineers at uh, Isovalent, which is now part of Cisco. And Isovalent is a company behind uh, Cilium Sinai and TBBF technology. And Daniel happens to be a co creator of both Cilium Sinai and eBPF and Linux kernel. So let's start. We have many slides today. So a year ago at uh, this same conference, Daniel presented a talk uh, where he showed uh, how to tune the Kubernetes networking stack under Cilium uh, to the maximum performance. And this year we decided to add um, another uh, variable to this equation. And this variable is encryption. So, um, it doesn't fit. Okay. So there are definitely uh, like use cases for encrypting traffic uh, from uh, application to application, and probably uh, the most common one is that you must be compliant with some framework. And uh, yeah, using the fact that there are so many people here, so. How many of you have to encrypt traffic in your clusters? Awesome, awesome. And how many of you do not know that it is super simple in Cilium to enable transparent encryption? <laughs> okay. Um, so, transparent encryption uh, means, means that uh, mm, we enable it once for the whole cluster, and then applications without any configuration, without any change to applications, uh, they, uh, their traffic will be uh, encrypted. And for uh, doing this on a CNI level, there are not actually too many options to do this. It's IPsec and WireGuard. Okay. So, IPsec. Both have benefits. Uh, IPsec, the first benefit probably is uh, that it's uh, compliant to many frameworks and some environments require uh, to use compliant uh, implementations. Uh, it is typically a little bit more complex in configuration than WireGuard, but Cilium for the most part uh, hides this, so uh, it's really easy to use it. Uh, one thing users still need to do is provide uh, keys and rotate them themselves. So with WireGuard, it's a new encryption uh, system. There are also benefits of it. Uh, it's really simple, really easy to understand. Uh, this makes it uh, more reliable in some cases uh, because users can't misconfigure it. And um, it also provides automatic key rotation, uh, and uh, in some cases, it's e easier for users to do this. So, in some cases, WireGuard is better than IPsec. For example, if you consider applications which needs more throughput, you can use WireGuard. In some cases, uh, IPsec behaves better than um, WireGuard if you need applications which need more. Uh, request response, uh, then you can use IPsec, but it's on you to decide. Uh, this talk is more focused on WireGuard, uh, because just because it was too broad scope to, to take both into account for, for like 35 minutes. So let's start talking about WireGuard from now on. Uh, I will cover now uh, uh, what is WireGuard, how it is configured, typically how it is configured in Cilium, and then Daniel will cover the performance part of it. So the first design choice of WireGuard is to be really opinionated on everything. And uh, this means, for example, that cryptography in WireGuard is fixed, and the bigger, the, the, the bigger benefit of it is that you can't misconfigure anything because you can't configure anything. And uh, for example, yeah, this curve 25519 uses the only way to WireGuard for WireGuard to exchange uh, symmetric keys using public crypto. 
and Chacha Poli is the only way to actually encrypt traffic. So, in a nutshell, where guard uh, establishes tunnels between two or more peers. And here we see like two peers. Uh, first, they create private and public keys, and then they use this uh, asymmetric crypt uh, to establish uh, uh, secured uh, sessions, which are secured by symmetric keys. This is done uh, over UDP. All, all the communications in WireGuard uh, are done over UDP. And after two-way handshake, uh, which is used to exchange symmetric keys, uh, a secure tunnel is established, and uh, packets can flow already securely between these two peers. And the best thing here is that WireGuard automatically uh, rotates uh, this um, uh, symmetric state, either when uh, IP address changes for roaming, for example, or uh, just on timeout, about two minutes or so, so which provides uh, perfect forward secrecy, and also it provides the benefit that the system is actually stateless from the user point of view. Um, the key distribution protocol in WireGuard is inspired by SSH, which means that there is no one, uh, and bring your own key distribution protocol. So the idea behind this is that, again, the less things you can configure, the less things you misconfigure. So users will find a way to configure, uh, to exchange keys if they want to communicate. And again, like in automated environments, uh, like in Kubernetes, it is really easy to achieve this, as we will see later. So, now let's take um, a deeper dive into how uh, two Linux machines uh, can establish a WireGuard tunnel uh, between each other. Um, so first thing is that, uh, of course, this machine needs uh, to run kernel, which supports WireGuard. And another thing is that uh, this machine needs to be uh, connected over some uh, media IP or IPv6 or both. Uh, and uh, the first thing we do is we create a virtual networking device of type WireGuard. It can be done normal using normal uh, Linux NetLink API, uh, which means that you can use uh, absolutely standard tools to create this device, to configure, to configure routing. Uh, the next thing uh, is to generate and assign private key for this device, which again, like it can be generated by any means, but uh, assigned using uh, NetLink API, standard way to configure network in Linux kernel. And also we set up uh, UDP listening port here, which will be uh, used by other peers to send traffic to. And again, like on the other peer does the same, creates device, assigns public, uh, assigns private key to the device, uh, somehow exchange public keys with its peer. And uh, the last thing uh, before we can send traffic is to actually associate uh, a public key of your peer with the list of um, IPs which this peer can use. Uh, this uh, called in our guard as script key routing. And this actually means that there is one-to-one -one correspondence between public keys and a list of allowed IPs. Uh, wh what does it mean is that if you receive a packet from a particular IP address, you can definitely say which public key it belongs to. And if you want to send traffic to some IP address, there is only one peer which allows this IP. So you also know which crypt to use to send traffic to and which endpoint. So, the other peer does the same, and again, from now on, users only see this WireGuard Zero device. Uh, users configure networking as needed, adding or altering or removing uh, allowed IPs from peers, uh, and that's it. So everything works. If you want to add another peer, you just add another peer. Uh, in Silum, the configuration from a like, user point of view is even simpler because you don't have to do anything besides creating a cluster with WireGuard enabled. And Silum uh, uh, runs on Linux, so the architecture is 
pretty the same. Uh, it creates Selenium WireGuard devices. Each node uh, creates a private key assigned to this device. And for key distribution, we utilize in the fact that we are running a Kubernetes and we just uh, distribute public keys uh, using connotations of Selenium node object. So other nodes can watch this object, reflect changes, and uh, everything works. The private key is actually stored uh, on uh, Kubernetes nodes on disk, and it is mapped uh, to the Selenium agent by this path. I don't know about use cases like this, but if you really want to force rotate private key of a node, you can remove this file, restart agent, and it will appear with a new one. And as it happens, uh, like the node object will change and everybody else will see this immediately. So Selenium allows to uh, encrypt traffic from many sources to many other sources. Here we will look at pod to pod traffic. But if you want to see how to configure Selenium uh, and what kinds of traffic there is, like pod to pod, pod to node, pod to service, etc., uh, at least uh, put a link here so you can go and check. Uh, let's take a look br like briefly at how uh, traffic from pod to pod is actually encrypted. So pod on the left wants to send traffic to the pod on the right. It sends it and uh, a BPF program, eBPF program on native networking devices, uh, uh, they see that traffic needs to be encrypted. It sends it to WireGuard device. WireGuard Device encrypts it, sets specialized key mark to tell the native device that it should be just forwarded to media, and then it's sent to the other side, decrypted and delivered to pod. So pretty easy. And again, like session keys uh, are rotated, and everybody is happy. So uh, we don't have time for a demo here, but um, even better, what we have is uh, our labs where like in one, two minutes, you can create your own Kubernetes cluster and set up uh, transparent encryption there using either IPsec or WireGuard. And I encourage you to do this. Uh, and this is only one lab of, I don't know, 40 we have. So if you didn't know about these labs, try, try them. So yeah, um, hopefully you now see that it's really easy to enable and configure WireGuard, but what about the performance? And with this, I pass to Daniel. All right, all right. So recently, uh, we got our attention to a blog post um, from people from Tailscale, uh, where they said basically user space isn't slow, but kernel interfaces are. And given we are kernel developers, we were naturally curious uh, what's going on. And um, they are using in their um, solution basically WireGuard Go implementation underneath. Um, and what they added uh, to make it fast was basically a mechanism which is called UDP GRO GSO. Uh, GRO is called generic receive offload. GSO is called generic segmentation offload. That's like a mechanism in the kernel. And what they were able to do for all the packets that are that where the packet path goes through the kernel to basically batch uh, the packets with uh, with uh, UDP messages. Um, into the tunnel device and, and, and out of it, right? So like all the path to the kernel was basically batched, which is why they achieved better performance. Um, and as a side note, actually, Cilium, we also had WireGuard Go support for a while, uh, like in the initial implementation. Uh, we basically used it as a fallback mechanism whenever there's uh, old kernel where it was not supported. Um, but actually, um, uh, more recently, it got removed because like Cilium, um, like the kernel support is basically widespread. So whenever you have a distribution, there's also WireGuard. So there was not necessarily an, an, a need for it. But more importantly, um, with the WireGuard Go, because it's a user space process which implements WireGuard functionality, um, the problem here is like if you recycle the, the, the pod, then basically the connections that go through WireGuard, they get disrupted, right? So. And this is not an issue with the WireGuard kernel driver because everything is nicely decoupled. Data path versus control plane, so you can update up and, and downgrade Cilium or restart it uh, while the traffic keeps flowing, no problem. Um, 
So yeah, but let's go on to the benchmarking. So we looked into, we're looking into unencrypted traffic versus the WireGuard driver and also the WireGuard Go implementation. Uh, before we do that, um, we wanted to get to a stable baseline. And actually on 100 gigabit NICs uh, going over bare metal, um, it's actually not that easy for a single flow to get to 100 gigabit per second. But what you can see here, like with the NetPerf, uh, we managed to achieve that. And basically this is how we did it. So like in terms of hardware, we had like standard off-the-shelf AMD thing, um, like an AMD CPU with PCI Express 4. Uh, we had Connect X6 uh, um, in NVIDIA NIX. And in terms of software, like a regular Linux, Linux kernel, uh, 6.12 from Linux Torvalds, Git tree. Um, we changed a couple of kernel configs. So usually by default, um, the distributions, they do not necessarily ship the, the best config in terms of getting the most performance out of it. So what we basically changed is the scheduling behavior for more server-heavy workloads into preempt none. And we removed the CPU mitigations in, in this case for the benchmarking and also some of the hardening, for example, for the page allocation and page freeing that where, where, where this gets cleared. This is actually very um, heavily uh, affecting the network performance. Um, we also removed a couple of other things. So for example, we turned off IO MMU. This is like a BIOS setting you can do for the grub command line for the kernel. We enabled LRO, which is supported with the connect uh, X um, NICs, uh, meaning large re large receive offloads. So when the current when the network card receives packets, you can already batch it in hardware. Uh, we changed the MTU to 8K. Uh, why? Because it's um, it gives a better placement for the kernel networking stack for GAO because all the data is nicely aligned, so it can it can batch it better. Um, we pinned <laughs> the, the, the NIC uh, RX and TX receive queue, um, IOQ affinity one-to-one -to, -one to CPUs. We set the uh, CPU governor to performance so that we don't get fluctuations when we do performance measurements. A um, couple more things, <laughs> as you can see, we enabled big TCP, which means like for the big TCP is a, is a technique in the kernel uh, uh, which was added a while ago to have more aggressive uh, batching. Uh, for the packets so that you don't have many packets going to the stack but like one really big one and also we tweak the tcp read and write memory so that it's not uh, adapted to the default 1500 mtu but more uh, like better supported for the for the 8k so what you can see here as i mentioned the baseline host to host over the network is like uh, close to 100 gigabit if you have the if you tr send the traffic to the wireguard device in the kernel you get for a single stream uh, flow uh, up to 25 gigabit per second. And then we also tested the WireGuard Go implementation and that's around 20. So the in-kernel one for, for this uh, case seems to be around 30% better. Um, for the transactions per second, meaning you're sending many small packets back and forth, um, the in-kernel one implementation is, is, uh, even, has, is, is even more. Um, can can as even more transaction per second than the than the wire got go. Uh, we were also curious how this looked with the standard 1500 MTU because many people might have this as default as well. And in this case, actually, the wire got go uh, implementation is around 35% uh, better than the in kernel driver. What you can also see is you do, you don't get any more to the um, close to 100 gigabit, but rather 60 something gigabit uh, for a single flow, right? And for the WireGuard Go, it can make better use of the UDP GAO batching mechanism that I mentioned earlier. However, when you have many small packets and transactions per second, uh, the in-kernel one is still more than twice as good. Um, so our, our question was, can we, can we do better for single stream um, performance? So in the, in the first thing is what we're looking into is how does WireGuard handle GAO and GSO internally? So if you take a typical stack trace, uh, from from the like from the Linux kernel, what you can see here, the packet is received on the on the NVIDIA device. Um, it's going into the core receive routine of the kernel, um, and it has MTU size packet length. And it later goes into the WireGuard device. It decrypts it, and it sends it again to the same core kernel receive loop. This time with a larger packet, right? So it's it's basically batched. If you have this in a more abstract view, it it looks roughly like this. So we are going twice through the stack, 
the, the, the first time we cannot aggregate something um, in the GO engine, but we are pushing the packet into the UDP socket of the, of the wire guard. And then later after the decryption, we can actually aggregate and push it up to the application. The transmit uh, path, very similar. You get the stack creates a large packet, um, larger than the MTU, so it makes use of the GSO. It sends it down to the WireGuard device. The WireGuard device encrypts it. Um, it sends it to the actual physical device, and then it's like an MTU-sized uh, packet. So this is how it looks on the, on, on the other end, and very similar, the application sends it down. WireGuard device actually expo um, uh, advertises that it supports GSO, but inside the WireGuard device, it needs to split the packet up into smaller packets. And given today there's no hardware offload for, for NICS, for WireGuard, uh, it basically needs to send down the MTU-sized ones. Um, so why does the WireGuard driver need to split the, uh, the big packet into smaller ones? Because the WireGuard protocol has basically a counter in the header field, which is for replay protection. So it needs to do this, basically. So if you look in, into the Wireshark uh, packet, this is basically how it looks. So it's an eight byte counter. And unless there's some offload at some point, there's not, not much we can do here. But what about the receive side? So on the receive side, we can actually take a shortcut. So we don't need to uh, go to the first stack, but on the first GO invocation, we can actually directly go to the WireGuard device. Um, this is like for later if you want to take a look um, offline. It's actually not too much code. Basically, the WireGuard internal driver registers a um, UDP GO handler, and that GO handler directly pushes the packet into the decryption engine of WireGuard and steals the packet basically in that sense. So what you get with this is uh, for the 1500 MTU, as, um, a nice 14% uh, gain in, in, in terms of a single TCP stream. Um, but it actually becomes less visible with the 8K MTU because it's already batched. So here it's just like a 5%, so not too much. Um, if you look at the CPU load, like for example, when you run HTOP, uh, across the, like for a single stream when you send this to, to the other nodes, what you can see is all CPUs get busy. And this is because WireGuard basically is, uh, spreads the encryption and decryption among the different CPUs. If you take a flame graph to analyze the performance, this is roughly how it looks. So there are many uh, kernel worker threads, uh, what, what you can see here, um, uh, doing things, getting busy. And what they are basically doing is, um, they're spending a large part of the time, obviously, on the on the decryption, also to make the packet data writable, um, and then pushing, like in a new software queue instance, the data up to the kernel stack. Um, also, the freeing of the packet can become a little bit expensive, um, but yeah. So this is roughly the picture on a on a higher level, right? So it, the packet comes in, it gets because of receive side scaling on the NIC, it gets to a particular receive queue that's being processed by a particular CPU. And then inside the WireGuard driver, um, when it processes the incoming packets, it, it will basically queue them into two different queues. One is the decryption queue, and the other one is the peer queue. The peer queue is basically there to keep the packets in order, because like for the decryption part, we're trying to spread the load across different CPUs. And once the decryption is done, it raises the software queue and then pushes the, the packet further up in the stack. Um, so yeah, I mean, that helps bulk workloads, but obviously you, if you distribute the traffic um, across CPUs, then you trash your, your, your cache from the CPU, right? So what about inline crypto? This was the next question we were asking ourselves. And we did a POC implementation. This is roughly how it looks in, in, in the, in the HTOP when you run the same benchmark again. And when you take the flame graph, you can see everything is done in one go on the same CPU. So now, looking at the single TCP stream, it actually decreases the performance by 60%, which is not great, right? Because now, like, all the decryption is done on the single CPU. However, the transaction per second gets much, much better. So, like, plus 86%, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and if you look at the latency, uh, I also did the added the WireGuard Go in here. So like the 
you know, like the latency there is, is quite bad because it needs to take the context uh, switch from kernel to user space and back mm -hmm. a couple of times because it's implemented in user space. But if you look at the L2, L2 GAO in the inline crypto, uh, it actually looks very, very good. Like it just at 24 microseconds, which is even lower than the native kernel uh, implementation with the minimum latency. So now we again at this question, right? Like, do we choose the request response type or the stream uh, workloads? Because, um, yeah, you can get some optimization out of it with the L2GAO, but there's no free lunch. So you basically have a trade off, like either small packets like, or like the, the bulk traffic. So the next step was like, okay, but what if we look into the case where you have multiple flows, right? Where, you, where we don't just try to optimize as much as possible out of it from a single flow, but multiple because that's more realistic. So yeah, can we, can we do better for multiple streams? Um, and what you can see here is basically we have a WireGuard device uh, and have many parallel TCP stream sessions. And what you can see here, we are stuck around the 30 gigabit mark. Like even if we, if we add more parallel TCP streams, it doesn't get better, it rather gets slightly worse. So it doesn't scale at all, unfortunately, which is, yeah, very unfortunate. So the question is, yeah, why? What, like what's going, what's happening, right? Because like for the east-west traffic, you usually have many flows. Um, and the reason is there is no RSS scaling. So basically, if you look uh, on the wire, like the TCP dump or whatever, uh, the traffic from one node to the other looks exactly the same. It has the same source IP, uh, same destination IP, same source port, same destination port. Even though the unencrypted traffic can be very diverse. Uh, but like after the encryption, it looks all the same. That's why it all ends on a single CPU. And that's why you get this performance. And IPsec basically has the same issue, right? So our colleague Ryan, he gave a talk about this yesterday in the Cilium and EBPF day. Um, so our first approach was, yeah, like, but what about multiple WireGuard devices? So then now they have different ports. What if you load balance traffic um, um, among them? So the first option was that that came natural. Well, there's bonding device in the kernel or team device. What if we create multiple devices from WireGuard and like put them into a bond device? Unfortunately, it's not possible. So you need to change the kernel bond driver because bond driver expects a layer two device, but that's all layer three. Okay, fair enough. Um, so what about multipath next hops, right? So what you can see here is like a IP route dump where you can load balance that way. Um, while this can be configured, we were quite happy about that, but then WireGuard, uh, uh, you know, refuses to operate <laughs> this way and basically what happens is um, we assume it's maybe like a WireGuard bug internally so that's still in investigating but if you have different uh, listener ports for WireGuard but all the other configuration is the same then basically um, yeah it, it, it black holes traffic for all the devices except one and even if you have different listener port, different key pairs, it's doing the same. But yeah, if you have different everything, like all the different configurations, then it then then it can work. And this is what we did. Um, and now we basically have many WireGuard devices um, and also parallel flows to that and send TCP stream traffic to that. And what you can see here, it already gets much better. Uh, so in, so here you have 1.6 times the aggregate throughput compared to the single WireGuard scenario. And it gets even better like uh, for the request response type workloads, right? So here you get the like, 2x aggregate transaction per second uh, if, you have, if you spread the traffic across multiple devices. Um, and this is thanks to RSS, so there's not, not no more other magic in there. But then the question was, okay, the limitation then becomes that you spread the traffic across the different kernel workers for the encryption and decryption, but what if you do this locally? Um, so what if you do the inline en en encryption and have those parallel flows? So this is what we also did. And you can see here on the, on the green graph that is in, a, in addition to that, um, we get even better overall, like uh, up to like 2.2x the aggregate throughput. What you can see here is like initially it scales linearly, but then it like cuts off at some point. Um, and uh, to, to, to add here, like the test systems, they had like 16 CPUs. So not too much. Um, 
but from the flame graphs, what we also saw is like uh, the the more work uh, it 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 gets, um, basically more gets delegated to kernel soft AIQ, and I, I think that's probably the reason why it cuts off here instead of going further. So where there's still potential to optimize. Um, and if you do the same for the transaction per second, we actually get to a 4x uh, better uh, aggregate uh, transaction per second, which is really huge. Um, so yeah, now the next question was that we had on, on, on our journey, instead of multiple devices, can we do it with a single device, but instead achieve the RSS through source port hashing? So basically, before the packet is encrypted, you take the the unencrypted packets hash, like of the of the five tuple, um, and after encryption, you pass this on as the source port. This is very similar to what we Xlan is doing, right? So you have like a fixed global port, and then the source port is the hash of the inner packet. And we also implemented that, and it's also working. Um, you can see here uh, from a TCP dump uh, screen that now for different traffic, you you have different uh, source ports, and this is also working. Uh, yeah, putting it all together, um, Cilium, EBPF, and, and our optimized WireGuard, this is uh, how it looks from, an archi from a high-level architecture point of view. So one, you have the NetKit devices connecting the pods. That's the talk I gave last year, uh, where we replaced the Weave devices with NetKit to get better performance and to remove the network namespace overhead. That's been in Cilium 116 already. Um, and then, in addition to that, for the WireGuard, we have the L2GAO I talked about, the source port hashing implementation, and the inline uh, en encryption for better scalability. So this is what we are uh, planning to get into Cilium and into the kernel, uh, potentially 118, uh, we'll see. So to recap, um, yeah, basically uh, Cilium has a native WireGuard integration, and it's actually it was super easy to, to, to use and get started. You just enable those knobs and everything is taken care of. Um, and yeah, crypto still comes at the, crypto done in software still comes at the high cost, as you saw. Um, but the way WireGuard is implemented it can actually be made significantly more scalable for multiple uh, flows. And that's the plan for getting this merged into the Linux kernel as well as Cilium. So, yeah, and uh, I would like to thank a couple of people. Martinas and Sebastian from our team, they had like many live sessions where they coded the integration, the initial integration for Cilium uh, together. And of course, also Jason, the WireGuard creator, uh, Jordan and, and James from, from Tailscale, they did the WireGuard Go improvement for the UDP, GEO, GSO. Um, David and, and, and Mirko, they, they uh, had a similar talk a uh, uh, few, few, few weeks ago where they found the same uh, issues that, that we discovered in, in our experiments. And yeah, and then of course the Cilium NetDev and BPF communities. So this is it. Yeah, if you have any questions, we're happy to know. Thank you.